Well, will you be seated? I mean, I, I did. We were, had a wonderful trip to Israel. John, John and I, he misbehaved all the time, as you could imagine. Um, and I was rather hoping that the camel would sit down because being on the back seat of the camel, as you know, the camel goes down this way, that I could push him over. <laughs> but the camel was stubborn and wasn't obliging. Um, but it's a great honor to be here with you guys today. It's a great honor to, um, to have been invited by John and Chantal to be here. But also to thank you because, you know, the fact of the matter is, this church couldn't be what this church is without them leading you. But they couldn't lead you without your uh, amazing generosity. If you believe in something, you give your time, you give your energy, and you give your money um, to what you really believe in. And you have built this remarkable, remarkable place. So I'm going to um, uh, give a short title to what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, and it is the shortest sermon ever preached, which we might even have as, a, as something to remind us on the screen. Now, you, you may laugh and say, shortest sermon ever preached. Um, that's clearly not going to be um, what you're going to do, and that's true. I, I am not going to, um, to preach the so shortest sermon today, and I dare say that you probably find your pastor doesn't do that either. But um, hold your breath, and before we, um, before we go on to look at the shortest sermon ever preached, I want to read something from uh, John's Gospel uh, for you, which will come up uh, on, on the screen as well. John's Gospel, John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Then they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead 
to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So I want to look at this. And you know what I love about scripture is it gives us little insights of very human people. Guess what? John wanted us to know that he ran faster than Peter. Did you notice that? Three times he says, I got there first. And, you know, that's, that reminds us that, um, you know, there is an element within all of us of, you know, wanting to be noticed. And I suspect that's what he wanted to do. Now, you remember some time ago, your, your pastor was, um, you, uh, was also undertaking some crazy thing on running seven marathons. You remember that? You see him, uh, see him here. But the point about it is, is when you're running and they ran to the tomb, when he was running there, he was running with a purpose. He was there running to be able to, to raise the funds for this amazing new place, which you sitting here in front of me and, and all of you that are watching online wanting to be part of this extraordinary church in this place. He had a purpose to the running. When you're running, there is a purpose to, to, to walk. You don't amble with purpose. You run with purpose. There's a direction, a clarity. And that is what they were doing. They were running to, to, that, to that tomb. And why was Mary running? Mary was running because she knew that she had been forgiven. She had an extraordinary love for, for Jesus. And I wanted to remind you of this. There is no power on earth that can be greater than the power of forgiveness in a community of people. There is no greater longing for the world than to see those that are freed from that which has held us back to be able to look to the future and there is no power on earth that is stronger than the knowledge of the resurrection. And Paul says that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is available to you and to me today. Because we are forgiven people. And I want to talk very briefly about post-traumatic growth. You know, we've, we've, we, we need to understand what it is. We've had a terrible time of post-traumatic stress, tension. We're not through it yet. But we need to begin to think of post-traumatic growth and forgiveness. The power of freedom, the power, the energy that comes from forgiveness is at the center of that. I was very struck uh, by an extraordinary statement from the Chancellor of West Germany, the leader of West Germany, uh, Angela Merkel. Um, quite recently, you might remember, she um, cancelled all gatherings over Easter. And then she said, I got it wrong. And she reversed the decision. And she got up in the German parliament and she said, the mistake was mine and mine alone. And I ask you, my colleagues and you, the country, for your forgiveness. And I was really struck by that. I mean, how, how, how many politicians do you know that would say, ask for forgiveness? We mustn't be too hard on politicians because... You know, we're much in the same boat. We'd, often we would say, well, I've made a mistake. I've cocked up something. I've, I've done something wrong. It's a mistake. I'm sorry. But actually, we don't want to go that extra step of, 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 of forgiveness. But forgiveness is not just for Christian people. This isn't just something that's created for Good Friday celebration or a memory. Forgiveness is available for all mankind, in all cultures, in all ages, in all ways. It is not something that is just special to us. It is what we give to the church and what we give to the, to the world. We give uniquely. Unique is the faith that we have. 
that has a cross, a strange kingdom, as the book I wrote and John mentioned, sitting there, and a love. Well, what does this love do? It motivates you in this church and you that are at home watching this to feed two million people in this area during this pandemic. Where does that motivation come from? Forgiven people forgive and forgiven people love. And that's why you, what you're doing it. And so it's just not something that we can forget. I was born in South Africa uh, and I had the privilege of meeting Nelson Mandela on several occasions. And you know, he was tortured. He was given dog food. He was kept in a prison for many years. And when it came to his inauguration, he invited his jailer to the inauguration. And when asked, because many people said, well, how could you possibly do that? The person that had locked you up, that had imprisoned you, how could you have that person at your inauguration as president of the new South Africa? Do you know what he said? He said, because if I didn't, I would still be in prison. There are so many things that still hold us back, that, that imprison us, that forgiveness unlocks. And that is where the energy for life comes from. And that's where the energy for post-traumatic growth will come from. It will come from the encounter that we have with the living Christ. And that energy will give us the ability to live well. And I want to tell you about the story of Mary. She encountered Jesus. She walked with him. She was delivered by him. She was a disciple of Jesus. She wasn't a missionary. No epistle bears her name. No New Testament story describes her work. But she had seven demons cast out of her. Not one but seven. Now, I don't know what they were, but one can assume that she'd have a, a totally um, dysfunctional personality as a result. Perhaps she was lonely or depressed. Her personal life wasn't what it might have been. She needed a savior. She needed someone to deliver her from what she was going through. Just as in the same way, the mental issues that we are facing in this pandemic time need the healing of Jesus through you and through me. Wherever you are, you may be in a church or you may be sitting at home. It's time for us to remember that that's what we do. We remind people there is light, there is a resurrection. There is trauma, of course there is. You've been fearful, I have. We still are. But we'll come through this. We will come through this. Not because of a vaccine, wonderful as that is. We will come through this time because we are learning that the good news of Jesus Christ enables people to be healed as whole people not just in one physical aspect thereof. And wherever you're listening to me, whether it's here or at, or at home or uh, in, a, in, a, in a gathering of any kind, remember that woman. She heard him teach. She saw him perform the miracles. She helped him pay his expenses. Isn't that amazing that those who helped to pay the expenses of Jesus was one of them was Mary. And on Friday... She was there watching Jesus dying, watching on that Sabbath day. Where were the big dogs? Where was Peter? Where was Thomas? Well, I suppose you might forgive him because he had doubts. <laughs> but Mary was there. And when Sunday came, she went to the tomb. What motivated her to do so? I, I love this, this picture while it was still dark. 
No, no woman would be outside on her own in Jerusalem while it was dark at the time of the Passover. It was a madness. But such was the motivation that she had, that she wanted to see the person who had made such a change in her life, that while it was dark, do you know, while it's dark, while it's dark in this difficult pandemic time, this lockdown that is so hard for us, while it's dark, while it looks as if there might be a twinkle but we can't see the light, we need to remember that she went out to see Jesus while it was dark as we can meet him even when it is dark. So she goes to say goodbye. She sees the stone has been taken away. Maybe it was grave robbers. So she rushes back, it's Peter and John to come with her and they run back towards the tomb. And when they get to the tomb, they have a look and see. And then, verse 10, the disciples went back to their homes. They had a look, they went back home. But Mary stood and cried. I mean, this is deep emotion, which many would have felt in this time. Deep emotion of loss, of distress, of disillusion. The person she loved was no longer there. She was going to bury him. She was distraught. She saw the two angels there. There come times when we're overcome with emotion, when the loss is acute. And you know, when we talk about loss, we're not just talking about a sad loss of a loved one as we think of Her Majesty the Queen and her family. At this time, it's a terrible thing to happen whenever it happens, however it is expected. It's painful. But we think of the loss that this pandemic has caused the loss of hope. What we thought was going to happen isn't. What we think is around the corner might not be there. We have a sound of grief at a world that has so changed. And we're trying to make sense of it. Do you know, I was interested, but Mary asked three times, where? Where is the body? Where have you put him? Three times. We've had three lockdowns. Where is God in this COVID? Where is God in my marriage? Where's God in my career? Where's God in my family? Where's God in my finances? Where's God in my future? Isn't that what we cry out to ask? Where are you? How do we build from that? What she didn't realize is he was there. So overwhelmed was she by her own grief. And you know what happens when we're deeply emotionally stressed? It is that perspective goes completely. The world closes in on us. You've been there. I've been there. We're so emotionally caught up. We're so stressed at it. We can't actually see that Jesus was there all the time. While she was going through this. The isolation and the illness. We struggle to see Jesus in the tombs of our own makings, in the tombs of our own desires, of our hopes, of our futures that have all been locked down. But the extraordinary thing is she has this, because she doesn't recognize him, but she has this conversation. And it's very important. Recognition leads to revelation. We need to recognize before we can see the revelation that comes from God. So I'm fascinated when we read through this. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? 
Who is it that you are looking for? Now, when Jesus started his ministry in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the first question he asks the disciples, what is it that you are looking for? What are you looking for? What do you want out of life? What is your purpose of living? What do you want to do to come out of this, out of this pandemic, out of this traumatic time, to grow? What is it that you want? But do you notice here, it's not what do you want, which was his first question. Now almost his last question is, who is it that you're looking for? It's a person, it's Jesus. Who are you looking for? Do you see the change? It's an entirely relational point. It's not some, what do you, what do you want? It's not even why are you crying. It's who are you looking for? And he asks the same question of you. And he asks the same question of me. Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him. And I will get him. It's a wonderfully ironic bit that. And she tells Jesus, well, why have you snatched your body away? And where are you hiding? And Jesus says to her, Mary. And she replies, she turns to him and cries out in Aramaic, Rabboni. Teacher. And there you have it. The shortest sermon ever preached. What is a sermon? A sermon, as you would hear from your pastor and anyone you're listening to, is an invitation and a response. I am inviting you to see something from this wonderful work of God. And I'm wanting you to respond. And Jesus says to her, Mary... By name, it was, a, it was a woman who was the first witness to the empty tomb. And witnesses who were women were hardly taken as credible in first century Palestine. But wasn't it wonderful of God to allow a woman to be there? And for his, he says, Mary... And she, who has previously said, they've taken the Lord. And again, she says, they've taken my Lord. Now she says, teacher. You know, all the softness of a teacher, what we learn from a teacher, the coaching of a teacher. There she is, this extraordinary revelation that it is Jesus. And sometimes we don't recognize Jesus even when we are, he is in our midst. So we're so traumatized by this whole pandemic, by the stress that we're going through, by whether we're going to have a job, whether we're going to have any finances, whether what are going to happen to our children and our schooling, and, and, and the ridiculous but important is, are we going to have a holiday? We, 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 we're completely traumatized by these events. They sort of crowd in. Do you know what that's like? But there is that personal meeting of a teacher and it's the word, when Jesus says Mary, it's that word that breaks the whole, uh, the whole picture. Suddenly she sees it's Jesus. Why? Because the word of God is powerful in itself. That's why we read it. And he says to you, Mary, Rachel, Chantal, he says to you by name, I know your name. And she's been called. When she heard his voice, she knew the source. She'd heard it before. But this encounter is not so much about her recognizing Jesus as much as it is her recognizing who she is to Jesus. She matters to Jesus. He's remembered her. He's remembered her. She was with him. She sort of coughed up when he ran out of money, bought the food, had the demon's chair pushed out of her. He cared for her. And just for a moment, it's not only a woman. In Mark's account, Jesus says to the women, 
Go and tell the disciples, and then adds two words, and Peter. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Peter, who a few days before had denied that he was ever with him three times. And it was that God was in Christ was restoring Peter through that woman, going back to him and saying, you're forgiven. Now you can start your post-traumatic growth. Calls him by name to build the church. He calls this church by name to build the church in this community, in this city, and for this country. But Mary, just see what's happening. Mary's overwhelmed. She now knows this is Jesus. And the first thing she wants to do is grab hold of him. Why does she want to do that? Is it because Jesus doesn't want anybody to touch him? Well, a week or so later, Thomas turns up and Jesus says, you know, put your hands on my side and look in my finger, my, my hands. No, you see, at this moment, this is this vital piece. Mary, in that picture, just imagine that scene. Mary turns to Jesus. She turns. And that's what we need to do. When we're trying to restructure our lives, we need to turn to him. So Mary turns to him and sees that, it's, that it is Jesus. And of course, everything has changed. And she grabs him and he says, ah, You can't. Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, in the plural, to my God and your God, in the plural. In other words, this has got this most extraordinary thing. For Mary, this could have been a false ending. And we need to be careful of that. There are many times when we get to a false ending. We may think this pandemic is over because we've got a vaccine. But it would be a false ending. Because we still have to learn to live with what has happened. Live with each other in a new community, in a new way, in a new normal, supposedly. But what Mary wanted is she wanted to go back. She wanted to hold on to that which she remembered about Jesus. That's what she wanted. And that's what he told her, you can't do. A new has come. A change is coming. You can't just be traumatized by what you're seeing, amazing as your love might have been. These lockdowns have forced us to rethink so many things. But the first thing she had to do in order to receive from him was to release him. The first thing we need to do to, re to receive this new, this new wineskins that your pastor was talking about, this new change is to release the memories from the past because they will haunt us. We want to think of what happened there and it's just going to be tweaked here, tweaked there and it's going to be all right going forward. It'll be a very changed world and it's a very exciting world. It's an exciting world for us because we know who we are looking for. We know that there is a relationship with Jesus Christ to receive from him. But before we have to release, and there is a turning point, I want to urge you to take that turning point seriously. The pain, the grief, the uncertainty, the disappointment. I don't know about you, but I'd be massively disappointed. Things don't go right. I mean, this economy is, you know, it's so difficult for so many people. Relationships are so complicated. I can't see anybody. I'm a natural extrovert. If you haven't gathered that, you won't gather very much. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't want to see people. I want to hug them, to talk to them. That's why it's such an amazing privilege to be here with you. For those that I can see and for, for you in your homes attached to this great church. And your pastor has written a new book. It's called Unmasked. That's what we've got to do. We have to unmask 
the things that we've, the avatars that we've created of ourselves, what we think we kind of look like, and what during this time God has been showing us, and painfully, a, a whole new way of seeing ourselves as we are. As he saw Mary, he saw Peter as they were. Didn't judge them. But you know, Jesus then says to her, Mary, go. It is vital for us to know the power of the resurrection. To renew our confidence in the resurrection power to bring restoration. The resurrection power gives us the restoration that we are looking for. If you're looking for post-traumatic growth, you need post-traumatic restoration. And that is vital. Forgiveness is not just saying all the things that, that we've got wrong. You know, there's a website called Come Clean, and you can go onto it, and you can post all the things that you've done, the mistakes you've made, the issues that you're facing. And people say, well, it helps me to put it on that website because I feel better. I've told someone. Well, you might feel better, but actually you won't be released. Because you can't hang on to the things of the past. We need to turn. Turn away from what the nostalgia for what was what happened in the past. You know, this longing for coming back to the normal. What if this new normal is something so exciting, so different, as it was for Mary, that there was this physical Jesus which she'd come to bury, and suddenly she finds not that he's buried, but he's not there, but he's alive. His word is still active. Right through her trauma, right through her pain, right through her isolation, all through her difficulty. And he says, go. The first sermon, evangelistic sermon preached again. Jesus says to her, go. He could have said to her, Mary, why did you just hang around here? Let's talk about old times. Let's reminisce. Let's ruminate. But he says, Go. So what's so amazing about your church is that you're a church that goes. You want to go to the city. You want to go to this community. And that's what she said. Go back and tell them. And there's the key piece. What has he got to tell them? I am going to my father and your father. At that moment, he established the whole community of the believing people of God. He linked us to God, to the father. He said, you've got me. And you're leaving me, but what you're going to get is this new community to my father and your father. It's a plural, your, in the text. And that is the community that we are building. And this is the time to take on the mantle, take on the mission of this place, of this community, of this city, of this country and of this church. You can deliver this. So let go to go. So how then, you know, we need to have this encounter with the living God. I'd encourage you to be reading your Bibles more regularly. I have a, an app called Glorify. I'm very proud of it because I'm chairman of it. And it was founded by my son who said, look, there are so many of these apps trying to help people come through this post-traumatic trauma. We should have a Christian one, short Bible verse, short meditation, some music. I can't sleep I can't, at night or I wake up early. Let's put it in one place, accessible. I use that. And I know you've been encouraged to use it. Use Glorify. You read the Bible. Find that time of encounter with Jesus. Secondly, the emotional regulation. We need to, to, re, to regulate our emotions. They're up and they're down. It's fearful one moment and it's okay at the next and then we go into overdrive and then we're dashed again and then disappointment comes and that whole traumatic experience of course is what Mary experienced and then educate yourself remember what has happened in the past and learn from it let go and learn so that we would learn from Jesus hear his words manage what he has given us you know allow there's no point in saying i'm not going to have any negative thinking well you are there's a fact but what we can do is that we can take captive every thought as the bible would say and allow the word of god to change we can turn from that which we think was the normal 
But what happens if the last 10 years was not the normal? What happened if we got it all wrong in that 10 years and we were going after worldly interests, worldly and cultural desires, following an agenda that wasn't that of the Bible and wasn't that of the Spirit of the living God? What would happen if we simply wanted all of that back again? It would be hopeless, but he's giving us something new. I want to end by t t giving you a story. You would have seen it all over the newspapers. There was a ship. It was called Ever Given. What a name. Ever Given. Do you know what is Ever Given? It's the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It's Ever Given. And that ship was in the Suez Canal. And if you can remember, if you would have seen it all over, it actually blocked the canal. Because it came, you know, as you, as you can see, oh, over, over there, the extraordinary locking in onto the side of where all the silting up had occurred. And this ship was blocking all the other trade coming through. Tens of billions of pounds was suffered as a result of a blocking of a narrow canal. It came to a halt. And you know, that is true of you and me. That there are things that in our lives that block the passage of the work of the Spirit of the living God working through you and through me. Unforgiveness, unconfessed sin, holding back on God. And this is a time for us to let the silt be taken away by the Spirit of God who convicts us of the things that are wrong. Who says, I want to clarify, I want to, to clear the channels of, of communication. I want you to be in a restored relationship. Because I want you to hear the Word of God. And the Word of God purifies. The Word of God cleanses. The Word of God takes the silt out. The Word of God moves the sin from us. And then as a result... There is a flowing through. We become human beings. We become fully human. When you are fully forgiven, you become not a religious freak, but a full human being. Jesus came not to make us more religious, but to make us more human so that we might be able to talk to people, meet with people, share the good news, go. So, soul church, sitting here or wherever you are listening to this, it's time to go. It's time to grow. It's time to learn post-traumatic growth. And while we learn it, let us remember this, that the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us the energy to take on this task. I'm not doing it in my own strength. I'm not doing it alone. But I am doing it in the power of the resurrected Jesus because there is no power on earth greater than the power of forgiven people who know they are forgiven and are telling others of this great good news. So would you like to stand? The shortest sermon ever preached was a little longer. <laughs> But then Jesus had a way with words. And what he says, Mary. And that one word, and he says that to you, Jane, Rebecca, Rachel, Sarah, and Peter, Michael, John, William, Sam, what are you going to do about that? He knows you. He knows your name. He knows your background. You're not going to tell him anything you don't know that he doesn't know. He knows you. He knows everything about you. He loves you. And he's called you. If you forget everything else I've said, remember those three things. And now I want to give you a chance to respond. Wherever you are, I'd like you to stand if you're not, not here with us in, in Norwich and Seoul Church. Whether you're sitting in your sitting room or in the kitchen. Just keep a moment 
of peace and I'd ask you just to put your hands out in front of you as a sign of receiving and I want you to say a simple word but really it is only one word but in that word you are saying to God open my channel to you open take away the silt of sin and disappointment and hardship and isolation and the trauma of this time I'm turning to you and I say to you you can say this aloud at home and through your mask here teacher did you say that teacher in other words I'm going to learn from you teach me this week teach me this week 